Good morning, uh, Enoch Baptist Church, and uh, all of you who are joining in with us today. Uh, what a beautiful day uh, to uh, recognize the wonders of what God is doing for each of us in our lives. What a wonderful opportunity to come together corporately and to give God praise and thanks for what he has done, but also to demonstrate to the world that we are confident, we have the faith to believe that our God is greater than any obstacle that comes our way, uh, because he truly is. Uh, today, um, we have a word from the Lord uh, in reference to our prayer life. You know, I know that um, all of us know inherently uh, that there is power in prayer. Uh, and most of us understand that our priority is to be in prayer. Uh, when we think about the value of prayer and what prayer can, can do, uh, we know that uh, biblically that um, uh, when the disciples looked at Jesus, when they walked with him and followed him, of all the things they observed him doing, uh, they watched him as he healed the sick. They, they saw him raise the dead. They saw him walk on water. They saw him feed the multitudes. Uh, they saw him casting out demons, um, and, and they saw all types of miracles performed by him. But isn't it, isn't it strange that they did not ask him to teach them how to do any of those things? The thing that they asked him to do was, Lord, teach us to pray, because there was something they recognized valuable about the power of prayer. Uh, that one thing that allows us to reach the heart of God and to touch him in a way that will allow him to do miracles on our uh, behalf. And so the thing that they understood was that this one thing was foundational to everything that the master did. So they asked him, teach us to pray. They understood that the prayer of faith would save the sick. They understood uh, that the prayer of faith would allow the dead to be raised. And they understood that the Bible helps us to appreciate that when we pray to God, that when we ask God for forgiveness, that he will honor our prayer through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and our sins will be forgiven us. They understood that the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And so when we look at our text today, what we come to appreciate is Two simple facts. Number one, that when the righteous pray, that God responds. Number two is that when Jesus prays, heaven and earth moves in order for Christ's word to become true. Um, if we look at our text for today, uh, and our text is found in the um, Gospel of John, and I'm going to begin reading from the ninth verse down to the 20th verse. Here's what we have. And if you will, please turn with me in your Bibles so we can all be at the same place at the same time. Here's what the scripture says. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, 
even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful that we have another opportunity to come before you to open up your word to your children. I pray, Lord, that you would touch each heart and every mind today that we might receive your word in a way that will enable us to demonstrate to the world what you are as our Savior, our Lord, and our King. I'm praying, Father, for strength today for all of your children and that whatever we may be going through, that God, you will allow us to do so in a way that will give you the glory. I pray, Father, for those first responders, for those health workers, those that are on the battlefield day after day as we go through this cycle of our lives. And I pray for each individual that has been impacted by this situation that we find ourselves in, asking, Lord, for your deliverance, asking God for your care, asking, Lord, for you to show us the way that we may know that there will be a brighter time at the end of our days. And we thank you, Lord, for the victory that we know you have bestowed in our pathway. And I thank you, God, for that salvation, for that grace that you have allowed to become a part of each of our lives. We lift you up. We glorify you. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, we claim our victory. Amen and amen. Now, when we look back at this text, <clears throat> here's what we have. Uh, Jesus has um, now come to that point in his earthly ministry where he is about to conclude his walk with his disciples. He's ready now to be sacrificed, uh, to shed his blood for you and for I, that we may have our sins forgiven by the sh his shed blood, and that we might have a right to be called children of uh, the living God. But in doing so, he recognizes that in his leaving this earth to go back to heaven, that those that followed him, his, his disciples and those of us who will hear the word preached and taught by those that came in the lineage of his disciples, that we would face some difficult times not because of who, what we are, but because of who we serve. Because what Jesus knew and what he taught us is this, if the world hated him, that the world was going to hate us. If the world sought to crucify him, the world would seek, seek, to, uh, seek to crucify us. And so those of us that receive Christ as our savior, we are always at, 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 at odds with those that are un, under the influence of Satan. And there is a, 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 a direct opposition where Satan wants to defeat us and to bring us down in his attempt to cause us to walk away from the God that has done so much for us. And because Christ knows this, he, he, he pauses in his walk to not only explain to the apostles about where he's going and, and what he has to do, but he also goes in prayer to our Heavenly Father about them so that they could be protected uh, along their journey. Now, not only does he pray for them, but if you look at verse 20, you'll see that he says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through the word. So his prayer is not just for those, those, those 12 apostles nor just for those disciples that received him on his earthly walk. But his prayer is for me. His prayer is for you. His prayer is for each one of us that calls on him as Lord and Savior. Now, that's a wonderful thing to just consider, if you will. Think about who's praying for you. Think about who's lifting up your name to God every moment of every day. 
You know, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, because of who Jesus is, is praying for us at all times, uttering up words of prayer to God that we even don't understand because there is recognition that we don't always know what we should pray for as we ought to. And there is a reason why we don't always know what to pray for, because you don't always know and I don't always know what lies ahead of me, but the Holy Spirit knows. I don't always understand those little things in my life that I have done that take me outside of where God would want me to be, but the Holy Ghost always knows. So the Bible says that there has been constant prayer going up for you and for I, that God would look upon us and smile and bless us with showers of blessings from heaven. And that's what this prayer is all about. This is a special prayer. This is an anointed prayer. This is a special prayer for God to shower down his anointing upon a specific and a special people. And I'm so glad that I am a part of that special people and you are too. I am so glad that the anointing of the Holy Spirit has fallen upon, upon me because of the prayer that Jesus prayed way back then. Because he said, I'm not just praying for the apostles. I'm not just praying for Matthew. I'm not just praying for Mark. I'm not just praying for Luke, but I'm praying for Michael. I'm praying for Sheila. I'm praying for Clarence. I'm praying for uh, John. I'm praying for Taniqua. I'm praying for uh, all those individuals that are members of Enoch Baptist Church. I'm praying for all those individuals that have received me as Lord and Savior. And that's what this word declares. Well, the thing that we have to then ask ourselves is if Christ is praying for us, what then was that prayer all about? What is the impact of that prayer? And what is the power of that prayer? Now, we've already come to a, an agreement that the Bible helps us to appreciate that those prayers that are done in fervent and, and, and faithfulness with sincerity, that God always answers. In fact, the Bible says this, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Who can be more righteous than my Lord and Savior? Who can be more sincere than my Lord and Savior? If you look back through the history of what Christ has done, it is evident that his father always honored his prayer. When he saw people that were blind and he prayed to God for their healing and laid hands on them, the blind received their sight. When he prayed for those that were lame and asked God to heal them, God blessed them and bones that were unable to receive strength, received strength, muscles that had atrophied, now got energy and the lame began to walk. He prayed for even the dead. And when he called on their name, they came back to life because God always will honor the prayer of his son, Jesus. When Jesus asks God to move, you can believe that the movement will take place. And here is a prayer when he's praying for us, for God to bless us from up on high. Now there are three things I want to key in on with you about this prayer. He says in his prayer to God, he says, I want you to keep them in honor through your name. I want you to position them so that when the world sees them, those that are of the world will have no choice but to recognize who you are as Lord. Jesus' prayer is that no matter what we go through, no matter why we go through, but because we have aligned ourselves with God through Jesus, he pleads that God will not allow us to be looked upon as failures or losers, but that God will deliver us in a way that demonstrates his power and his glory. Good God to mighty. That's something to be excited about, to know that Jesus has said to my heavenly father, I want you to bless them. I want you to bless them. I want you to keep them in honor of your name, not for them, but for your name 
So when people know that they belong to you, that they will give honor to your name. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? That means that no matter where I am positioned in life, when I walk out and let people know that I belong to God because I am saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Have I got anybody that's saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost that's listening to me on today? When you know God as your personal Savior, when you are saved and you have received Christ and you have received that victory through the blood of the Lamb, that says that God will always keep you from staying down because his name is at stake. Not my name, but God's name is at stake. If I stay down, it means it looks like that I am serving a God that cannot take care of me. And so Jesus' prayer is that God would always pick me back up so that he would get the honor and the glory out of my life. Now, the beauty of that thing is also this, that there are going to be times when I may fall, not because of other people, but because I may stumble on my own. But even when I stumble on my own, what Jesus' prayer is that God will still lift me back up and restore me so he will get the glory out of what has been done for me. Think about this for a minute. When people see that you have been moved to a place of desperation, but they also see that in that desperation, you called upon the name of God and God delivered you, you don't get the glory for where for yourself being delivered. God gets the glory because they know that your, 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 your deliverance was because of what God did for you. And so that's what that prayer is all about. That's something for each of us to get excited about right now, to know that there is no failure in our God. And because there's no failure in our God, we can never be left to fall where we won't be picked back up. We will always end up more victorious coming out than we were going in because in our life, God is going to always get the glory out of our station in life, what we do and where we have gone. I don't know about you, but that excites me right there to know that I serve an almighty God that sits high, looks low, and therefore there is nothing that no one can do to me to keep me from ever being victorious. The second thing he says is this. I need you, God to fulfill my joy in them. He says, fulfill his joy in us. Now, if you think about this, Jesus received unspeakable joy because of one simple concept. And that was the simple fact that his walk on earth was so that we would receive him. He received joy in that we received him. The Bible says, that every time an individual gets saved, that all of the angels in heaven began to rejoice. That's right. The angels have a party every time one individual gets saved. And now what Jesus prays for, he's saying, Lord, that same joy that I get, the same joy that Gabriel, Raphael, the same joy that all the angels get when one individual gets saved, that's the joy I want you to put in my people. I want you to put that kind of joy in them, that unspeakable joy that will be kept in them. And Lord, what I want you to do is put it in them in a way that the world can't take it away. You know, that's something to shout about right there. You know how we always testify the world didn't give it so the world can't take it away. You know how we always testify that, that, that the joy, this joy I have, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Here's what the scripture says, helps us to understand. That the prayer says that the joy that we get, Jesus wants us to be in us such that, that anything that we're going through, that it will never allow our downturns to extend beyond the point of our joy. That no matter what I go through, I will never go through it to the extent that
that I still won't have joy. Help me, Holy Ghost, right there. That doesn't mean I won't go through some stuff, but here's what it means. I don't care what I am going through. It will never be so devastating that my joy won't still be there. It will never be such that I still won't know and feel that God has already made a way for me to get out of it. I know that many of you that, that are listening and watching me right now can testify with me the many times that you have remained joyful, even though people that are looking at you thought you ought to be losing your mind. I can tell you that there have been times when I'm talking with people in the congregation, when I'm counseling people, and they're telling me about the downturns in their life, but yet and still they will say to me, but pastor, you know what? I don't understand why I'm not sad. I know I ought to be crying. I know I ought to be upset, but for some reason, I'm not even bothered by what I'm going through. For some reason, I'm still happy. And I'm wondering if I am losing my mind. And I have to tell them, no, you're not losing your mind. You have the joy of the Lord inside of you. Jesus prayed for you that you would keep your joy. So when something happens to you, it doesn't bother you anymore because you know that God has you in the cradle of his arms. And when you have that kind of joy, people cannot get you down. Now, what he says is this, that God will position you so that nothing will happen to you that will take you past your point of joy. Meaning there could be a place that would cause you to be sad, but God won't ever let you to get beyond that point. You may get close to it. You may get right up on it, but you will never get past it. So you will always have your joy. You will always feel good. I need about two or three of you right now that are watching me to just touch the person beside you if you're watching with somebody and just tell them, I still got my joy. We may be going through this cycle with coronavirus, but I still have my joy. If I have someone out there right now that's drawing an unemployment check, I need you to raise your hand right now and just shout if you're all by yourself and say, I still have my joy. If you just got a check from the IRS, you need to raise your hand and say, I still got my joy. Anything that you are going through, know this. You may have gotten to your breaking point almost, but God didn't let you fall. He will never allow us to be broken. We can bend, we can move, we can do all things, but we will never be broken because God will never allow us to get to the point where our joy will be taken away from us. The third thing this prayer does is this. In this prayer, he says, sanctify them from evil through the truth. Now, I'm going to stay here just for a moment because this, I believe, is one of the most important parts about this prayer. When he says, sanctify them from evil through the truth. You know, for those of you who are Old Testament scholars, I think Solomon kind of described this best when he talked about man's greatest strength and man's greatest weaknesses. Solomon declared this, that man's greatest evil is his dependence upon his own strength. And, and I point this out to you for this simple reason, because for most of us, it is because of our strength that we place ourselves in peril. Consider the folk in the Bible uh, who, who lean to their strength and not to their weaknesses. Because your strengths, you just presume you're going to be all right with. So you don't, pray for, you don't pray for God to increase that which you think you are good at. What we pray for is for God to help us go through the things that we think we are weak in. And so we neglect to focus on that which we consider our strengths. And so Solomon indicates that sometimes our strengths can be that which causes us to fall the quickest. If we, if we think about this, look at Noah, for example. The Bible says that Noah was a man of great faith. Now, Noah was given a charge. His charge was to build an ark because rain was going to come. Many of you know the story. 
Now, while Noah was building the ark, the scripture helps us to appreciate that those around him were mocking him. They were partying. They were drinking. They were having a good time. But Noah's greatest strength was that Noah stood fast. He did not waste his time partying and drinking. He stood fast. He was upright. And because he was upright, the Bible says he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But yet when they arrived on dry land, after spending all that time in the ark, being isolated from other family, being isolated from friends, not being able to leave that ark, the one thing that was his greatest strength became his greatest weakness. Initially, Noah was not a partier. Noah was not a drinker. But when Noah got off that ark, it was his inability to stay away from alcohol that caused his greatest downfall. That which at one time been his strength now became his weakness. Look at Abraham. The Bible says that he is the father of faith. But consider this. When Abraham was unable to have a child with his wife, that thing that should have been his most greatest became his weakest. Because even though he was the father of faith, he did not have enough faith to believe that God could make a way for him. So rather than hold on to his faith, he went in with a surrogate mother, had a child that became the, the, the enemy of his own people. Think about this. Look at Moses. Think about what happened when, when the children of Israel needed water. A part of Moses' greatest strength was that Moses was a meek, a mild, a measured individual that knew how to control himself. But when the children of Israel needed water and they go to Moses for water, rather than Moses following God's instruction about how to get water from a rock, in his anger, he hits the rock and that created a situation where Moses was not able to go into the promised land. Look at Peter, for example. Consider this. Peter was the one that told Jesus, I will go with you anywhere. Peter was the disciple that seemingly had the most courage. But when this little girl said that Peter was one of Jesus' disciples, Peter denied him thrice. Now, why is that? Why am I saying that sometimes our greatest strengths can become our greatest evil? It is because we have a tendency to keep our guard up when we know we're weak. But in areas of our greatest strength, we depend on our own ability and thereby becoming vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. When we are weak, we'll always pray. Help me, Lord. Guard me, Lord. Keep me, Lord. See me through, Lord. But when we are strong, that's when we often act as if we can do it ourselves. And the minute that you think you can do it without God, that's when the evil of the world will creep up and knock you down. That's why Jesus prayed that we would be kept from our own evil and from the evil of the world so that we would not get caught up in thinking we can do it by ourselves, but we would know that we need him. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. I recognize in every aspect of my life, I need Jesus. If it had not been for the Lord that was on my side, I would not have made it where I am right now. So what does that say then? What does that say to all of us? How then do we allow that to be our walking point. Here's what we know. Special prayer for a special people. Special prayer for a unique and special people. The Bible says this, effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. Look who you got praying for you. Good God Almighty. Look who you have praying for you. We got Jesus. Here's what we know about Jesus. We know that he is the most righteous entity that ever walked on this earth. We know that his prayers are the sincerest prayers that are ever going to go up. We know that they are effectual because we know what Jesus' prayers have done through the history of the world. 
We know that they are fervent because we know that Christ prays always. So we know then if that be the case, if our God is praying for us, if God be for us, who can be against us? If the God that you serve is the one that's praying for your victory, how in the world can you ever fall? If the God that you live for is praying that you will succeed, how can you ever be overcome by the enemy? If the God that you have always put your life in his hands is the one that is saying, I want you to succeed. If that's the God that is the controller and ruler of the world, how can we do anything but make it out better than we came in? Saints, I just want you to understand something today. And it's a simple thing. And that is we are being prayed for by a special individual. We have been prayed for by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A special prayer that he put up just for you and just for myself. His word tells us that he was praying for us even before we knew him as our Savior. And he prayed that God would bless us once we called on him as our king. For those of you who have received Christ as your personal Savior, oh, I hope you know how blessed you are. I hope you know how wonderfully positioned you are to succeed in this world. He's already given you everything that you need to sustain you. And he's already positioned you for greatness. He's already prayed for you that no harm would come to you. He's already prayed for you that God will get glory out of your life. He's already prayed for you that you would continue to have joy and prayed for you that no evil would be able to bring you down. Not just the evil caused by the outside, but even our own neglect cannot bring us down because he's praying for us even when we don't know what we ought to pray for. If you don't know Christ as your savior, he's prayed for you too. He's already prayed for you that you would come to know him as your Lord and your deliverer. He's prayed for you that God would receive you as one of his children, that your name would be written in the Lamb's book of life. I tell you today, saints, we're living in a wonderful time. You may not think that way right now, but I tell you, you are. You're living at a great time because of who has already prayed for you, who has already given you the victory. Our almighty God, if God be for us, who can be against us? A special prayer for a special people. Jesus was the special prayer. This is his special prayer. We are his special people. If you're with me today, if you know Christ as your savior, I'm praying for you that God will continue to show you how special you are, that God will show you and direct you so you can receive every blessing and get the fullness out of it. If you have not received Christ as your personal savior, I'm praying for you today too, because I want you to get every ounce of glory that God has in store for you. Let's look to the Lord right now. Let's seek him and let's let him make a difference in our lives. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, God, I just want to thank you for your word. I just want to thank you, Lord, because you've been so good to each and every one of us. Lord, you have opened doors that have been shut in front of our face. And, 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 and you have closed doors to keep us protected from those that would come in and do us harm. I thank you, God, because when we have been knocked down, you always lifted us back up and placed us on solid foundation. I thank you, God, because when the enemy tried to dig our grave, God, you pulled us out, set us up so that your glory would shine through. I thank you for every member of Enoch Baptist Church. I thank you for their solidarity. I thank you, God, for their perseverance through these difficult times. And I thank you, Lord, for the support that they have shown to continue to spread the word about how good a God that we serve. And God, I'm asking you right now, additionally, to look on that individual under the sound of my voice. 
especially that soul that is near his death, the one that does not know you in the pardon of their sin, but is calling upon you right now to receive them into your bosom. Thank you, Lord, for receiving them right now. I'm thanking you for saving them and giving them, God, a permanent place in heaven up on high. We praise your name today. We lift you up today. We glorify you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Saints, thank you so much, as always, for being a part of our ministry. Thank you so much for being so supportive. Continue to pray one for another as we pray for you. God loves you. He loves you more than I could ever tell you. I love you too. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.